Welcome back to Face the Nation. For more on the impact of the court's decision, we turn to our chief legal correspondent, Jan Crawford. Jan, this was a huge decision. You accurately predicted it uh, for months December back in December. Show. Um, but what we know is the Supreme Court ruled a state can now ban abortion not only before viability, which is 24 weeks, but at any time in pregnancy. So what does that mean? What does post-Roe America look like? Well, I mean, I think, as you saw from your excellent conversations with Governor Whitmer and Governor Nome, there's going to be a patchwork of laws based on what the states there think about abortion and the right to abortion. So it will depend on where you live. And if you're a woman in a state that bans abortion, unless you can get your legislators and your governor to change that law, you're going to have to travel to another state to get an abortion or try to get medical abortion, those pills by mail. But as you saw from Governor Nome, some states are going to try to ban that as well. But the point is, women do have more options now, I guess. If we look back to what it was like before Roe, there are more options. Um, abortion is generally more discussed. There's more support for women seeking abortion than there was then. Uh, but in some ways also, the conversation has gotten more punitive now. You see efforts to punish women and efforts to turn neighbors into bounty hunters of sort. So it's going to be interesting to see how that works out as we progress. No, it's a great point. And I think we're we're just beginning this conversation, right. really, about abortion. Um, but the decision itself made at the core, the security that day was incredible. And we know the Supreme Court justices themselves are under heavy guard. Well, there's been a significant amount of threats. I mean, and even before the ruling, uh, we saw an attempted assassination attempt, a man charged with attempting to assassinate Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, the, the protests we've seen so far, though, they've largely been pretty peaceful. And uh, I think groups on both sides are really trying to condemn any violence and keep the debate really focused not on violence, but on the real issues that go to the core of um, women's rights and, and the rights, as the other side says, to the of the unborn. Justice Thomas wrote that this court should revisit decisions related to gay marriage and contraception. But the conservative majority, Justices Alito, Justices Kavanaugh, they both said in their opinion that it doesn't call those things into question. So which is it? And does this set our country on a course towards, you know, political and legal conflict. Well, I mean, yeah, more more political and legal conflict than we have now, right? Um, so, yes, I mean, Justice Thomas wrote that separate opinion that the language was obviously very jarring for some people to read, but he has one vote, and it takes five. And the court majority said it's hard to see how we could be any more clear that those cases, the right to contraception, the right to same-sex marriage, are not in doubt that abortion is different because, as the court said, it involves a life. You had Justice Kavanaugh writing a separate opinion, making that point, emphasizing that point. Those cases are not at risk. So right now, there are not five votes on the Supreme Court to re-examine those cases. There is one. But it opens that conversation about, do you need to put those things into law, codify them? There's, there's so much more here, Jan. You're going to be busy. I'm sure you'll be back with us. Thank you for your uh, analysis here. In last week's January 6th committee hearings, we learned of President Trump's pressure campaign on state election officials in Georgia and Arizona, along with efforts to recruit his own Justice Department, then led by Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen, to overturn the election and claim fraud without evidence. Mr. Rosen said to Mr. Trump, quote, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. How, how did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. A top Trump aide also testified that at least five members of Congress who helped spread Trump's lies about fraud in the 2020 election later sought pardons for their roles. The only reason I know to ask for a pardon is because you think you've committed a crime. California Congressman Pete Aguilar is a member of the January 6th Select Committee, and he joins us from New York. Good morning to you, Congressman. Good morning, Margaret. We also heard sworn testimony that the former president spoke to the Justice Department and Homeland Security about seizing voting machines. There was testimony this week that a Pentagon official and uh, the defense secretary, the acting defense secretary, were chasing a conspiracy theory about Italian satellites changing votes. These are outrageous ideas, but, but how far did this actually get? 
Well, I think what the, the testimony uh, and, and what we have laid out clearly indicates that the president you know, knew he lost the election, uh, and then he continued to gravitate to these conspiracy theories uh, along the way uh, in November and December, calling the election corrupt, as we heard the Department of Justice officials. Uh, and then when every legal door had closed and he lost over 60 lawsuits, uh, then the pressure campaign to the Department of Justice, to his own vice president, uh, that's what we saw. But there was no shortage of conspiracy theorists in his ear uh, each and every time. The text messages to Mark Meadows lay that out, theory after theory, uh, individuals bringing things up uh, that had no basis in fact and that his own Department of Justice refuted. Does Vice President Pence, who you just mentioned, um, does he need to come and testify before your committee? Well, that was the, the hearing that I led, was all about the president's pressure on the vice president. Right. Um, we heard directly about that pressure campaign uh, from his top legal counsel uh, at the time. Uh, and we think it was an important hearing. Um, and clearly, there is a lot more uh, there. And we would obviously love to gather more information. Um, but I think we clearly laid out the case that the, the president uh, had no regard uh, for the vice president's safety, never reached out to him uh, that day at all, uh, and uh, was willing to sacrifice his own vice president um, uh, while stopping a peaceful transfer of power if it meant holding on to power himself. But you don't have a firm no from the former vice president. You know, I'm not going to get into uh, you know conversations uh, about. Uh, future interviews or witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, but what I can tell you is that the committee has said from the very beginning, uh, more information uh, is good, and we're always going to be willing to take in more information about what happened on January 6th and what were the causes that led up to January 6th, uh, but okay. clearly as we have laid out in five strong hearings, uh, that this is just about telling the facts, and that's all we're concerned about. So uh, we look at our own polling and we see that confidence in the U.S. electoral system uh, is not faring well. Most Americans think at least somewhat likely in the future, according to our polling, election officials will refuse to certify a result for political reasons. Do you think, based on the work you've been doing, that the public should feel more confident? Well, I think the public should be aware of this, and I think that's exactly what the hearing has sought to do, uh, which is how do we protect democracy? This is bigger than, than Donald Trump. This is bigger than one individual. How do we protect democracy and make sure that we stand up for the rule of law? And clearly there were individuals who did their job that day uh, mm -hmm. and leading up to January 6th. Uh, Brad Raffensperger and other uh, elected officials uh, who truly did their job. Uh, but in the future, uh, there will be an option uh, or there is a possibility that people may not do their job. Uh, and I think that's the problem uh, that, we, that we face. There's a, a little bit of competing background noise there, but I do want to ask you, um, we heard from those Justice Department officials who testified this week uh, about Mr. Trump's plans to install this lawyer, Jeffrey Clark, as the acting attorney general to help his scheme here to, to overturn the election. Um, and Liz Cheney, the vice chair, made a passionate plea for the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, to come and talk to you. Are you going to subpoena him? Why is he not on the docket? Well, there will be future hearings. Uh, there will be more witnesses. Uh, that's what I can say. I'm not going to get into uh, specifics uh, for witnesses, but I believe that the vice chair was very clear uh, that we would love to hear from Pat Cipollone. Uh, there are other witnesses uh, who we feel uh, will add to, uh, uh, to what we are doing and the work product that we're putting together on uh, future hearings uh, that we have when Congress reconvenes. Uh, we look forward to these future mm -hmm. hearings. This is about piecing together this puzzle for the American public. And so yeah. we know clearly uh, what's at stake in protecting democracy. I want to uh, read the names here of the individuals we heard this week uh, actually asked for pardons due to their role on January 6th. Congressman Jim Jordan, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene inquired about presidential pardons. A White House aide testified uh, that Matt Gates, Mo Brooks, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert, Scott Perry, all sitting congressmen explicitly asked for pardons. What action should be taken against your fellow lawmakers? 
Well, many of these lawmakers we have asked to come before the committee. Uh, we have sent them letters. Uh, we have sent some subpoenas uh, to them. Um, what's important is that we tell the truth. But as my colleague Adam Kinzinger mentioned, uh, there really isn't, I think the American public understands this, uh, folks asking for pardons generally feel that they did something illegal. And so I think it's important that the public understands that. Uh, I think what people understand about the January 6th committee is that we only present things uh, based in evidence and fact. Uh, that's exactly what we laid out this week. Uh, we look forward uh, to laying out you know, more facts uh, about uh, what happened as well as uh, this topic. And we will look for those further hearings. Thank you, Congressman, for your time today. We'll be right back. We're joined now by Mark Short. He was former Vice, President's, uh, Vice President Pence's chief of staff. Good morning to you, Mark. Good to have you here. Good morning, Margaret. Um, we've been hearing a lot about you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you were with the former Vice President on January 6th when he sheltered um, and when he ultimately went ahead and certified the election results that day. Is he watching these hearings and, and why is he dragging out that decision on whether to cooperate? Oh, I don't know that I'd say he's dragging out a decision on that, Margaret. I think as, as far as the just question of uh, is he watching, I think we all lived it. And and I don't think that uh, probably, I don't think he's waiting with bated breath and watching these hearings in the same extent that perhaps some inside the Beltway are. Mm -hmm. um, last week, for instance, as the hearings were going on, he was out campaigning in Illinois for Darren LaHood and Esther Joy King. He was campaigning for Steve Shabbat. He was up in New York campaigning for Lee Zeldin. He's trying to make sure Republicans have a great midterm cycle, and that's where his focus is, looking to the future and not relitigating the past. So Congressman Aguilar should not expect the former vice president to come speak to the committee? I'm going to leave that conversation to the vice president and his counsel to answer that, Margaret. But I think it would be incredibly unprecedented, and I think it would, it's also, I think, conversations between a president and vice president that there is a separation of powers that should be respected. And let's keep in mind that there is currently a former vice president who occupies the Oval Office. Do you want Congress to be able to drag up former vice presidents for certain subpoenas or for certain testimony? I think this we created terrible press before in history. Sure. I mean, this is incredible. You lived it, as, as you say. We did live it. And Margaret, I think that um, both myself and, as you know, the chief counsel have been uh, under subpoena, have uh, testified for many hours. And so mm -hmm. Uh, we've told, I think, the story of what the vice president's team witnessed and saw. Let's ask, uh, I want to ask you about the team. Um, former Trump chief of staff, Mark Meadows, your counterpart, his name comes up again and again. You just heard the congressman mention it, too. Uh, the acting attorney general testified just a few days ago that it was Meadows who was distributing this bizarre conspiracy theory about Italian satellites. I mean, he was sending gifts or wanted to to Georgia state election officials. How complicit was he in this lie? You know, Margaret, I think that um, Mark would often say to me that he was working to try and get the president to uh, concede and accept uh, the results of the election. And at the same time, it was clear he was bringing in lots of other people into the White House that were feeding the president different conspiracy theories. Um, I think that uh, Mark was telling different audiences all sorts of different stories. And so um, I think, as I've said on many occasions, I believe the president was very poorly served by the team that he had around him. And I think that they fed him many conspiracy theories about uh, the events that conspired um, on Election Day and then that followed. Mm -hmm. But there were individuals who stood up to the president and said, that's not true. That's false. That's unconstitutional. That's illegal. The vice president was one of them. Mark Meadows did not. I think the vice president's been a consistent constitutional conservative his whole life. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, I think we're all proud of the way that he handled that day. I, I want to ask you about abortion in a moment, but just here on, on this topic, the January 6th committee revealed this week that uh, the chief of staff for Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin was trying to pass along fake electors to the vice president to right before he was set to certify the election. Were you aware of this scheme? Was the senator directly involved? I have no reason to believe that the senator was directly involved. I know that Chris Hodge and our director of alleged affairs shared with me that um, in text that came in and, and I had said to Chris, respond that not to deliver that to the vice president. Because what we learned when we sat down with the parliamentarian, Margaret, is that honestly, this happens every cycle, that members send in 
separate fake sets of electors every time, every four years. But the, they come into the archives of the parliamentarian and they dismiss them. If they're not certified, it's kind of meaningless. Wait, are you saying what Ron Johnson's staff was doing was no, totally I'm not, kosher? I'm not saying, I'm not, no, I, I didn't say that, Margaret. I said that what happens is that individuals across the country can send in their own set. They do it all the time. It means nothing, though, unless the state has certified it. And so, the senator's and staff. And so we, we intentionally were like, no, there's no interest in seeing a separate set that has not been certified by the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But wasn't that troubling to you? I mean, this isn't just someone randomly sending it in the mail. I it's, think it's it a was senator. clear at that point of where we were in this that there were other electors that were being submitted. So I can't say that it was necessarily shocking at that stage of events. Was he the only one who tried to do this? I don't this? know of any other member of Congress that, or, or staff that tried to know. But I have no reason to know that Ron Johnson was, was behind that or not. It was a staff-to-staff -staff conversation. It's pretty incredible, frankly. There were a lot of incredible things that happened around that day. Yes. Uh, we, we could talk for the next hour, Mark, we, about we that could, day. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to ask you as well, though, about the former vice president who, as you mentioned, has been out there on the campaign trail. One of the things that um, Mike Pence is known for is being a staunch opponent of abortion um, and uh, very much pro-life. You played such a key role in getting these three Supreme Court justices on the court who did vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, this, this conservative majority um, directly linked to the administration you served in. You are now talking about, the vice president is, former vice president, a ban on abortion. So going further than where we are right now. What does a ban on abortion look like? Well, I think that the vice president has been championing life since the very beginning of his public career. And I think he was one of the ones in Congress, as you know, who advocated for a pro-life position and advocated for ending of taxpayer funding for abortion. Rape or incest. I think that uh, where we believe that, that life begins at conception, but I think the vice president has always accepted exceptions um, for rape and incest because he believes that we should continue to move forward toward a... a a more perfect union that includes the protection of life. I mean, what about Margaret, like what Governor Youngkin's doing in Virginia, 15 weeks? Is there a room for compromise like that? Margaret, I think that uh, we are going to continue to champion life wherever we can. And if that means that, that you're able to, to extend that more protections for, for unborn children, we're going to advocate for that. I think it's important to keep in mind that there never was, there never was, anything that, that justice could refer to to say in Roe v. Wade, there was a protection or right. a, a certain right for women to afford abortion. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg right. herself she said it was, it was highly unusual for them to have such judicial activism in the case of Roe v. Do Wade. Do you oppose the kind of surveillance and I think punitive we action as, against women? We as conservatives are always better when we're speaking from a position of compassion than condemnation. And so we should be acknowledging that there are multiple victims in abortion, not just the child, but also the mother. And we should be looking to provide those women mm -hmm. with the care and services that they need. Mark Short, good to have you here. Thank Margaret, you thanks for, for having me. We'll be back in a moment. We now want to welcome David Malpass, president of the World Bank. Welcome back to Face the Nation. Thank you very much. There are a lot of stressors on the global economic system right now. How do you describe where we are? It's a sharp slowdown, including even China. So we, we've seen the world growth uh, fall by half since January in terms of GDP growth, uh, but there's also shortages, there's inflation, uh, and, and the food shortages for the poorer countries are becoming a significant concern. They already are. I mean, global inflation, it's not just the U.S., it's other wealthy countries around the world, but you're also describing a recipe for global instability. It feeds in when there's not enough food that uh, for for weaker countries, poorer countries, that that causes uh, instability, and it's a big factor in the turnover of governments that's been occurring in quite a few of the countries. So, COVID caused the deepest global recession since World War II. Now, uh, the world economy is in danger because of this Russian invasion in Ukraine. How do you avoid a global recession with all of these factors? Some countries, it's going to be very hard to do that. I think uh, that, that uh, leadership from the stronger countries is very important. Uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities, tools. For example, the, the uh, central banks have many more tools than in 2008. There are regulatory tools that they have. Uh, they now hold huge bond portfolios. Those could be, uh, th those are all funded by money from banks. The bottom line is there needs to be lots more production 
and it, that's most available to the strongest countries. The US is the world's biggest economy and can increase production more than anybody else. So if you were talking to Jerome Powell, the chair of the US Federal Reserve, you would say focus less on interest rates, fo focus more on what? He's got multiple tools. One is regulatory policy. The Fed is a, an important regulator of banks, so let the banks lend more. Uh, but then also on the bond side, uh, reducing the bond portfolio would return more money to banks. All of the money being used to hold the bond portfolio comes from banks. And if they had more, they could lend. And also the non-bank sector of the U.S. economy that's one of the most innovative, and it could put more money into the supply chain. So a State Department official said a few days ago, food crisis will be at least a three-year problem. What time horizon do you put on the food crisis and the energy crisis? I'll say one thing. It's possible to produce enough uh, to, to soften that crisis. But at the rate that we're going right now, the fertilizer isn't being made. You know, fertilizer comes, a, a, a giant source of fertilizer is from natural gas uh, through the ammonium channel into the, the most useful fertilizer. And it also is used to make the electricity that converts uh, uh, the minerals into fertilizer. And that's just not happening. So a lot of the world is shutting down for lack of fertilizer. And then those shortages of crops will last for multiple years years. We need to break that cycle and do it pretty forcefully now through announcements. The Federal Reserve Chair said this week in this country that recession is certainly a possibility uh, in part because of higher interest rates. Citigroup puts the odds of a recession at 50 percent. What's your projection here for the world's most important economy. We, we put out a report three weeks ago that didn't have the U.S. in recession, but we said in downside scenarios there could be. And so I, I don't disagree with those estimates that you're saying there. So do you agree with Fed officials when they say it's going to take at least two years, a couple of years before we get inflation back down to 2%? It's going to take time to come down, but uh, again, that depends on what are, what's your forecast for oil prices, for natural gas prices, for fertilizer. It's going to take months and months and maybe two years to bring inflation uh, back down. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. We'll be right back. And a reminder, if you can't watch the full Face the Nation, you can set your DVR or we're available on demand. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.